Welcome back home, COP family. To prioritize your safety, please listen closely as we remind you of these health and safety protocols required by the Department of Health and the IATF. All COP campuses will be thoroughly disinfected before members are allowed to come in. Before entering the COP premises, always wear a face mask and a face shield. Please undergo temperature scanning. Use the disinfecting mats. While inside COP, use the sanitizing stations every 20 minutes. Take note of our social distancing markers around the campus. Always follow the signs and maintain the flow. Use the foot markers when queuing. Use the assigned stairs when going up or down. When finding your assigned seat or exiting the auditorium, please approach our friendly ushers and they will gladly assist you. Please remember that you can only sit on chairs with a red marker. A safety officer will always be present to assist you for any concerns regarding the mentioned protocols. We're doing our best to help keep you safe. So all you need to do is seek God and focus on His Word. Welcome back home, COP family. Wow, that feels good to say. We are back in live worship services and it's wonderful to be able to say, see you face to face. We have five weekend schedules. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. We'll finally get to worship, pray, and learn the Word all together again in God's house. But how about the kids and seniors who can't attend services yet? Don't worry, lots of options are available. Everyday Jesus and Senior Moments to Remember are still available online. And our South Saturday drive-in service at 7.30 a.m. is a lot of fun and still available. And our services will still be on Facebook and YouTube. For more information and latest updates, keep checking our social media pages. COP family, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's go to the house of the Lord.
Welcome back home, COP family. To prioritize your safety, please listen closely as we remind you of these health and safety protocols required by the Department of Health and the IATF. All COP campuses will be thoroughly disinfected before members are allowed to come in. Before entering the COP premises, always wear a face mask and a face shield. Please undergo temperature scanning. Use the disinfecting mats. While inside COP, use the sanitizing stations every 20 minutes. Take note of our social distancing markers around the campus. Always follow the signs and maintain the flow. Use the foot markers when queuing. Use the assigned stairs when going up or down. When finding your assigned seat or exiting the auditorium, please approach our friendly ushers and they will gladly assist you. Please remember that you can only sit on chairs with a red marker. A safety officer will always be present to assist you for any concerns regarding the mentioned protocols. We're doing our best to help keep you safe. So all you need to do is seek God and focus on His Word. Welcome back home, COP family. Wow, that feels good to say. We are back in live worship services and it's wonderful to be able to say, see you face to face. We have five weekend schedules. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. We'll finally get to worship, pray, and learn the Word all together again in God's house. But how about the kids and seniors who can't attend services yet? Don't worry, lots of options are available. Everyday Jesus and Senior Moments to Remember are still available online. And our South Saturday drive-in service at 7.30 a.m. is a lot of fun and still available. And our services will still be on Facebook and YouTube. For more information and latest updates, keep checking our social media pages. COP family, let's go to the house of the Lord.
Good evening everyone. Welcome to our Saturday night worship service. We are glad to see you once again here in God's house. Hello to all of our wonderful campuses there in Maine, South, there in North, here in East, Bulacan and Pampanga and Nai campus. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in God's house. Let's all stand up and we are going to be praying for the fast recovery of our economy. COP, how do we pray? Fervently and with joy. Let's lift our voices to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we, once again, God, we are so grateful, Lord, for bringing us once again, God, into this wonderful place, into your wonderful house, oh God. Thank you, Jesus, that you are walking among us, Lord, in the midst of your people. Holy Spirit, thank you so much, oh God, for bringing us, assisting us, ushering us into the throne room of our Heavenly Father, that we can come confidently and with boldness, Lord, to lift our voices, God, unto you. Heavenly Father, we lift up to you, God, for the past recovery, Lord, of our economy, Father. Thank you so much indeed, God, that in the midst of this pandemic, Lord, we have a God who restores and that you have promised, Father, in the name of Jesus, that there's going to be a restoration, Father. Lord, this year, 2021, Father, we believe as you have promised, Father God, for a double restoration, Father, including, Father God, for our economy, Lord. And we thank you so much, Father God, that your hand is being extended, Father, to heal our land. Thank you so much, oh God, that you will bless our nation as your presence, oh God, will flow. Thank you so much, indeed, God, that there's going to be a restoration as your presence will flow. Lord, let your hand be extended upon our nation, O oh God. And thank you, Lord God, for the promise, Lord, that you have said in your word, that you have given us the ability, Father, to produce well. Many businesses have been affected, Father, but we do know, Lord, that you will bless your people and that they have the ability, O oh God, that the anointing, Lord, will flow into their lives and that you will bless the work of their hands. Father, we thank you so much, God, that indeed, Lord, it is your will that there's going to be a fast recovery of our economy, Father. Lord, as you have blessed us, Lord, even pre-pandemic, Father, it's the same way that you will bless and you will restore. Even, oh God, 8, 9, 10% of our GDP once again will soar and will rise in the name of Jesus because you will bless the businesses of God, of our people, of our, of our countrymen, Lord. You will bless our nation and that there will be their businesses of God will flourish and that God, they will reopen and soon reopen, Father, that God in Jesus' name, that there will be confidence once again in the business sector, Father, as you will provide, Father, for their capital, O oh God, in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray, God, for abundant harvest in our nation, Lord God, in our agriculture sector, Father, in our farms, O oh God, in our livestock, in our agriculture, Lord, in our crops. Thank you so much, O oh God, that indeed you will bless in Jesus' name. That God, there will be more investors, O oh God, even from foreign investors, Lord, even and Father God, from our people, of oh God, that there will be confidence once again in investments in Jesus' name. Father, as you bless, Lord, as you restore our economy, Father, thank you, Lord, that your name will be glorified as you will bless your people, oh God, that you will make your people, Lord God, distinct, oh God, from the unrighteous. Your name be glorified, Father, as you will bless, Lord God, our nation with abundant harvest. Your name, God, will be glorified as you crown the year, Lord God, with your bounty, Father, and as our nation will be blessed. We will all give back all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is the light of this world, and the unfolding of his word gives light. Jesus is the Christ. Not a way, a truth, and one way of life.
At COP, we know that like the apostles, we are to preach the gospel publicly and from house to house. It is a privilege to be in your homes sharing the gospel. At COP, we know a pastor is to teach the Word of God, enabling us to live lives that please the Lord. At COP, we know we are to preach the gospel to the poor, bringing them to what Jesus called life and life more abundantly. At COP, we heal the sick in Jesus' name, and our God is with us even to the end of the age. At COP, we know that the message is the gospel. We love it, we live it, and we preach it. It is the good news, and it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. At COP, our eyes are on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We don't worship worship, we don't worship fellowship, we worship Jesus. At COP, we know that we have been called by God to be priests. We are to serve Him. We don't live in our own little world. We serve Him fervently until every lost person is found. We will build 200 churches across our land and across the world in the next 20 years. At COP, we know every member has been given the Great Commission, so we joyfully work while it is yet day, seeing people born again, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and learning to live for God. At COP, we know that we are to bear fruit and not to gather fruit. There is no shortage of people that need to hear the gospel. Our joy is to go to the harvest field and then bring the harvest field to the Lord. At COP, we know we are to fill His house with His praise. We praise the Lord. We praise Him for who He is and what He does. If it's not about Him, it's not praise. At COP, we know that the tithe is not about obedience to the law. It is before the law, during the law, and even Jesus taught tithing. It is our joy to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse to the Lord. At COP, we know prosperity is about trusting our Heavenly Father for everything we need. No fear of debt, no fear of poverty, no fear of people. Our Father is our provider. At COP, we know that Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father. That means that we are part of a great family of God across this world. When one part of that family needs help, it is our role freely give as we have freely received. At COP, we know God's grace abounds to us, teaching us to say no to sin and to work hard for Him.
our COP campuses and wonderful branches and those who are joining us in the courts of the Lord and online. Good evening and welcome to our Saturday evening worship service. Now, if this is your first time or you've been here before, we just want to remind everyone so that we can all enjoy this wonderful time in the house of God. That please be sure that we maintain and observe social distancing all throughout the services. And also, let's all wear our face mask, our face shield properly. And please do help us out by completing those contact tracing forms as we work hard in following government guidelines and regulations. Now, are you ready to worship the Lord some more? Yeah. Let's head back to main campus and let's give all the glory to Jesus.
everybody said. Would you join your hands with yourself, please? Father, we come before your presence tonight. Lord, such a grateful people for all that you have done for us. Such a grateful people for how all during this thing you put food on our tables, you provided for us. You bless the work of our hands. And Father, we come and we say thank you yet again. Lord, I lift you all of our people at home tonight. Father, with this any sickness in their body, let it leave yes, in the Lord. name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Let healing and strength Jesus. flow to the bodies of the people Amen. of God. Let provision flow to every family. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, give yourself a big hug and you may be seated. Those of you that are tuned in and watching us, if you're above 18 and below 65, we'd encourage you to be in the services. we got lots of empty seats, hallelujah. You can sit up on the top of the balcony all by yourself. But after 15 months, some of you have gotten out of the habit of being in church, and you need to be in God's house. And everybody that's here said? All right, I want us to move quickly because I've got a lot of things that we want to get done tonight. We're celebrating Pentecost weekend. We have people filled with the Holy Ghost and refilled with the Holy Ghost in the cars this morning at South Campus. Now, I never, I thought, how are we going to do this, Lord? And we just started praying, and God started touching people in the cars. You know, God can do things in different ways. It's been a good weekend. Now, in this year, when we recognize that with the economy going the way it's going because of this COVID thing, we said that there's a lot of companies that are downsizing, that are laying off, that are retrenching, and we don't want to be part of that. Back in the 80s and 90s, one of the things I learned as a pastor was we need to help people learn how to be retainable and promotable, because we learned that companies don't get rid of people that they need to rebuild their futures with. They only let the people go. The first ones out the door are the problems. Everybody say the problems. The next ones out the door are that big group of about 80% of people that nobody ever thinks about. And then they start working on those. But the last ones out the door are the ones they want to retain. These are the retainables and the promotables for the future. Now, we've been learning together that the first ones out the door are people who release toxins. And we said a, a toxin, if you look it up in the dictionary, it doesn't exist in nature. It, it's something that is created by another living organism. We learned that lazy people release toxins in the workplace. Quarrelsome people release toxins in the workplace. And now we're just going to spend two weeks on the word resentment. Everybody say resentment. We learned last week that the Hebrew word deals with a strong emotion of anger that flows from a real or a perceived, and most often it is a perceived grievance. Everybody say, I felt hurt. Say it again. You didn't really get hurt, but you felt hurt. And the Greek word adds to the idea of keeping a mental record. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, or rather 13, verse 5, the great love chapter, the NIV says keeps no record of wrongs. The ESV says does not have resentment. It's the same Greek word. The Greek word for resentment literally means to keep a mental list of grievances. Everybody say, never let go, never move on. Now, last week we learned that leaders can't have it, and we looked at the first great example of resentment, Judges chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. A group of men from Ephraim felt that they had been left out of the battle, and their pride was pricked, and they got their hearts full of resentment. But let me look on, and I want to finish this out quickly tonight. Who are the other people other than their pride is pricked? Who are the other people that get their hearts filled with resentment? Secondly, it's a group of people that don't like correction. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 12. A mocker resents correction. Now, one of the things you have to learn to do in leadership is when you see somebody who's a mocker, everybody say a mocker. They're just always acting superior and putting down other people and mocking other people. You have to learn. Don't go correcting these people because immediately they develop resentment in their heart. Everybody say correction. Sometimes it's correction by a person. Sometimes it's correction by God. Proverbs 13 verse 11, my son, 
Do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. There are people that have all kinds of resentment in their heart toward God because God rebukes them. But now when someone who loves us corrects us and when God who definitely loves us corrects us, we, we shouldn't have resentment. Somebody's trying to help us. I didn't hear you. So people who don't want correction get resentment. Now, in addition to that, you've got some people who choose to hold resentment in their heart. Resentment is a choice. Job chapter 36, verse 13, NIV. The godless in heart harbor resentment. Everybody say harbor. There are people that choose. I'm not going to move on. I'm going to keep this. I, I want to hold on to this. this. This attitude of resentment is something I intend to hold on to. I'm going to keep this anger. I'm going to keep this resentment. It's going to stay there. I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life. Well, there, there are people that they make that their choice. Now, there are three people in the Bible that it speaks about full of resentment. These are people who have all chosen to hang on to it. Number one is a fool. Job chapter 5, verse 2. Resentment kills a fool. The second is the mocker. Proverbs 15, 12. A mocker resents correction, and he will not consult the wise. The third is the godless. Job 36, verse 13. The godless in heart harbor resentment. So when you see people holding on to resentment, recognize you're looking at a fool, a mocker, or the godless. Everybody say, a fool, a mocker, or the godless. Now, putting all that together, why is it that resentment is so toxic in the workplace? Well, we learned last week, Judges chapter 8, verse 1 to 3, these men were full of resentment, and notice how it manifested in verse 1. And they criticized him sharply. Now, that's a really good thing of the Hebrew, really good translation of the Hebrew, because it refers to very violent, aggressive responses. Everybody say, violent, aggressive. This is not criticism to help somebody. This is criticism that is meant to cut, criticism that is meant to maim, criticism that is meant to damage. Now, now this is what a person with resentment in their heart does. They intend to inflict pain and damage on other people. Everybody say, pain and damage. Secondly, resentment is self-destructive. Job chapter 5, verse 2, NIV. Resentment kills a fool, New Living Translation. Resentment destroys the fool. Now, brothers and sisters, one of the reasons why you and I never want resentment in our heart is because when resentment fills your heart, it's self-destructive. It's what? You may think that you're lashing out at other people. You may think that you're bringing, you know, damage to other people. But really, all resentment ever does is destroy yourself. It destroys your future. Everybody say, it destroys my future. So you have to learn resentment is one of the most self-destructive. Resentment and guilt are probably two of the most negative, negative destructive emotions that can exist in the human heart it destroys everybody say it always destroys now the last one is very difficult proverbs 15 12 a mocker resents correction he will not consult the wise now it's not that this person is unteachable it's they have no desire to learn everybody say no desire they, they don't want to learn. They have no desire. It's not just unteachable. It, it's, I don't want to learn. Now, brothers and sisters, you, you, you see this in people's hearts. And you see it in offices. You see it in companies where a person is always mocking what somebody else has done, always putting down what everybody else is doing, always critical about what everybody else is doing, always, I mean, they're just mocking everybody else. Watch, because you're looking at a person who's full of resentment, and you're looking at a person who will not listen and will not learn. Everybody say, will not listen and will not learn. This is not a person who will sit down and let others instruct them. This is a person that if you begin to talk to them, they lash out. Remember, resentment has that sharp, destructive criticism. They lash back at you. 
So you have to learn. The, these people are very difficult to have around. They refuse. They have no desire to learn. Now, brothers and sisters, we don't want any of that stuff in our heart. We want to have, we want to be teachable, and we want to learn. Everybody shout, I want to learn. All right, that's my offering thought. I'll be, in a few more weeks, we'll be getting into how to be promotable. Would you put your tithe in the red envelopes, please? Your seed in the blue envelopes? Those of you that are out in the parking lots here at South, or here at Maine, down at South, and over at East, thank you for coming and being in God's house. We'll have the ushers serve you there. When you're ready, up in the balcony, we have the baskets out here on the ground floors in Maine, South, East, North, Bulacan, Papanga, and Nayakavite. Come, bring your tithe and seed before the Lord. Let's all stand up and may ask all our wonderful ushers in all of the campuses to assist us. And let's stretch our hands and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, God, that we all have always the reason to rejoice and make some noise to worship you, Father. Even then, Father, tonight, God, thank you, Lord, for the teaching of the Word of God, Lord, so that we can continue, God, 
to be prosperous, to be promotable and sustainable. And even, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come and honor you, Father, with your tithes and be able, Father, to sow our seeds because you have blessed the work of the hands of your people. Father, we are so grateful that we can expect a financial harvest for your people this year, and we are so thankful, Father. May we ask the rain of the Holy Spirit to be poured unto all these seeds, and it will grow and produce a harvest to your people. Father, receive these seeds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's all be seated this week at COP. This week at COP, our big news was the opening of our beautiful new campus in Naik Cavite. Friday and Saturday were test runs, with our ribbon cutting happening during the 10 a.m. service on Sunday. Naik is allowed 30% capacity at church, and it was full every service. We have wonderful singers, dancers, musicians, leaders, workers, ushers, car ministry, every kind of help the church body needs to be successful. If you live near Dear Nai, both live and drive-in services are available and Pastora Josie would love to see you. This week at COP, would you look at this beautiful machine, COP? This is our long-awaited very own communion machine, which we will use to supply individual sanitary portions of our communion emblems from now on and until years to come. We praise God for this blessing which arrived in our parking lot this week after being released from customs. This is what the cup looks like, and the bread element will sit on the top of the cup, and this is what the seal will look like at the top. This machine has the capacity to produce 1,600 to 2,000 cups per hour, meaning to meet COP's needs in Services and Fortress 91, the machine can do that in less than a day, and our cost is just a fraction of what we have been paying per unit. Let's give God a big clap offering for this tremendous blessing in our church. This week at COP, did you know COP that now that we're back in GCQ, water baptism is back. Some of your new believers have been waiting for some time now for their chance to follow the Lord in water baptism. And here it is. If your new believer friends are ready and willing, please coordinate your schedule with your district pastor. We follow all IATF protocols for sanitizing with pastors in full PPE, mask, shield, and so on. Praise God for this wonderful part of our faith being back in full swing. This week at COP, we are a soul-winning church. Our mighty men in uniform saw 344 uniformed souls saved from camps, forts, stations, and a Philippine naval ship. District 23 praises God for 19 souls saved in trio outreaches. Our mom of praise, Nanai Loli, may be a senior locked down at home, but boy can she preach the word of God boldly. She has also never stopped meeting her Go group during pandemic. District 22 held their Kai Cristo District Crusade and praise God for 74 souls saved. This week at COP UAE, Pastor Al Jeff had the privilege of water baptizing six new believers. This week at COP, over 300 people attended the Luke's Call webinar and prayer time for frontliners. Six people were saved. Dr. J.C. Malabad shared the gospel after teaching about the various vaccines. COP Luke's Call medical professionals are available to answer your questions about vaccines on their Luke's Call Facebook page. So feel free to ask. Just proceed to the Facebook site shown on your screen. This week at COP was the graduation of Batch 1 for our Just for Kids summer music program with 85 children. It's always so adorable. Our second batch is underway with 133 participants from all campuses. This week at COP, CAD is busy online training 546 music pastors and church musicians from churches all over the country in our Summer Basics music classes. Participants were allowed to choose two classes each from theory to applied and classes are overflowing. This week at COP, we praise God for His blessings on our families as they dedicated their harvest to the Lord. From COP Calgary Go Group, Sonia Benedicto dedicated her condo. Emily and Red Ortega, Saturday Ushers, dedicated their rice and grains business. 
The Kalim Lim family from District 1 praises God for the dedication of their new home. We can see their home was burned to the ground in December 2020, but praise God for our year of restoration. As a bonus, five loved ones were saved during the dedication. And we love car dedications. The Abad family, their Ertiga, Annabelle Pagurigan from Hawaii dedicated her Highlander. Nora Deason, her commuter van. The Novoa family, their first family car, now they can bring their kids to drive in. The Lontaka family, their expander. The Castro family, their Honda. The Rojas family, their Vios. The Vergara family, their Vios. The Balawing family, their Kia Sportage. And motorcycles dedicated by Mark and Christine, by Anna and by Lawrence. And finally, COP, coming up, our youth department will have summer camp online both June 5 and 12. This is open for youth 17 to 23 years old. It will be via Zoom and Facebook Live with link opening as early as 8 a.m. Activities will be from 9 a.m. till 4 p.m. Get your link, young people, from the campus youth pastors. It has been another great week at COP. Would you open your Bibles tonight, please, to the book of Luke? I'm sorry, John. John chapter 16. We'll get to Luke in a little bit. God has been good to us, amen? We're so happy to be back in GCQ. All of our campuses are at 30%, and we're going to continue opening in Jesus' name. How many of you have already had at least one shot? Would you raise your hand up high? If you've had one shot, put up one hand. If you've had two shots, put up two hands. All right, so just a few of us have had our double shots already, some of our seniors. Now, I, I just want to bring this out. I'm not a doctor. I do not give medical advice. But at the same time, I realize that a lot of the um, American Christian television shows are having a lot to say about vaccines. Folks, please listen to your doctor. Do what your doctor asks you to do. If your doctor tells you the vaccine is safe, go get your shots in Jesus' name. I didn't hear you. It's, you know, some of the stuff out there, some of the rumors out there, it's the mark of the beast. You just want to look at people and go, would somebody just lighten up? We've been taking flu shots and yellow fever shots and polio vaccine shots since we were born. Lighten up a little bit. I can't hear you. All right, I want to begin to teach you today about the Holy Ghost. Everybody say, it's Pentecost weekend. Fifty days after the death of our Savior was the next great feast, the Feast of Harvest. And it was on that day that God chose to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4 tells us the story when the day of Pentecost arrived. They were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven. Now, I want you to notice, everybody say, all together. But that was only 120. 500, you know, 500 watched the ascension, but only 120 stuck around for the Holy Ghost. You don't want to miss what God is doing. They were all together in one place, and there suddenly came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And the entire house where they were sitting was filled, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there's so much teaching in this passage. It's beautiful about the wind, and it's beautiful about the fire. But let me just throw one thought out at you about the fire. The fire came down as a pillar and then went into individual tongues of flame. Everybody say, one pillar splitting into individual tongues. So it started as one and became 120, one tongue of fire on the head of each person. Now, people often say today, well, on the day of Pentecost, Fire fell. Why does fire not fall today? Well, because in the Bible, every time God accepted a temple, he sent the fire one time 
and then they were to keep the fire burning. Everybody say, keep it burning. When the tabernacle of the wilderness was dedicated, God sent supernatural fire one time, and then they were to keep the fire burning. When God moved the tabernacle from the tabernacle to the temp what we call Solomon's temple today, he sent the fire one time, and then they were to keep the fire burning. When he sent the fire, he was showing his acceptance with the solid, solid pillar of fire, showing his acceptance of the church, the local church, as his temple. And the individual tongues of fire showing his acceptance as the, of the individual believer as the temple. Everybody say, I am accepted. It is the acceptance of the new covenant temple. We are the temple of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God has accepted that temple. But the church was to keep the fire burning. In the old days, first century, there was no such thing as a non-Pentecostal church. Every church was Pentecostal. Every church spoke in tongues. Every church had the gifts of the Spirit in operation. And really, into the early 300s after the death of Jesus, even the Catholic churches had a special room. You can look at their old architecture. Had a special room that was built for people to go and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues. But something happened to the church. They didn't keep the fire burning. God sends the fire. We keep it burning. But I want us to back up even farther than Acts 2. In John 16, beginning with verse 7, Jesus looks at the apostles there at the Last Supper. And he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, you look at that passage, and ever since we read that last week in our devotions, that verse has been right there, like it's been tattooed on the forefront of my mind. I, I think about it falling asleep and still thinking about it when I'm waking up. All during the day, I just keep thinking about it because I look at it and I go, you know, Jesus looked at his, his apostles that had just spent three and a half years with him and said, it is to your advantage that I leave and send the Holy Spirit to you. Another translation said, it is to your profit. Another translation says, it is better for you. And I look at that and I go, you know, if I was Peter, I would have looked at Jesus and said, excuse me? It's better for me not to be walking around with you? Now, excuse me, Jesus, for three and a half years, everywhere you've gone, I've gone. We've slept on the floor in the same room every night. We've eaten breakfast, lunch, and dinner together in Merienda all day, every day. Every, I've watched all of your miracles. I've watched you heal the lepers. I've watched you open blind eyes and deaf ears. I've watched you walk up and touch a dead guy's casket, and he rises up out of his casket. I've, I, I, Jesus, excuse me. It doesn't get any better than walking around with you. And Jesus would look at him and say, no. It's to your advantage that I go away so I can send the Holy Spirit to you. Now, again, you look at that and you begin to think about the implications of that. If I was Peter, I'd say, no, no, Jesus, I'm going with you. <laughs> no, Jesus, it doesn't get any better than being with you. I'm going with you. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Peter, it's to your advantage. Now, yes, I know the passage from Luke 12, or John chapter 12 and John chapter 14. I will send you another Alos, another of the same kind of helper. He's going to be just like me. Yes, I know all of that. But what blows my mind is that Jesus would say that what we have today with the Holy Spirit poured out on our lives is better than what Peter had when he was walking alongside of him by the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And forgive me, my brain doesn't get that. 
My brain goes, there is no way it gets any better than hanging out with Jesus. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? It doesn't work. Come on. Now, now beloved, please. You, you look at this and you go, okay. We know Jesus is right because he's always right. And on top of that, he said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. He said, let me tell you something that's true. Let me tell you something that's real. It is more advantageous for me to leave you and send to you the Holy Spirit. And we know he's right because he's always right. Everybody say, Jesus is always right. So if he's always right, that means it is more advantageous the experience we have today with the Holy Spirit than what the apostles had walking around in the physical presence of Jesus. Now, I look at that and I go, you know, obviously I have a lot to learn about a relationship with the Holy Spirit because I know this is true because Jesus said it. But it's just my mind cannot comprehend that thought. I was looking at one of my old Bibles, in fact, my very first Bible this week. My old college roommate, he was a Christian long before me. When I got born again, he got this Bible and he wrote in it. And he had very nice handwriting. He, write, he wrote, died September 19th, 1975. Date of burial, September 26th, 1975. Cause, Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Filled with the love and glory of God and the Holy Spirit, November 23rd, 1975. Now, he, he wrote, went on and wrote some other things. I, I look at that and I go, okay. I have been baptized in the Holy Ghost and spoken in other tongues since November 23rd, 1975. That makes me feel very young. Within a month or so, God was using me in gifts of the Spirit. Within a couple of months after that, or within another month after that, I was preaching. Even as a pastor of this church for many years, I would go to Korea. I was on Dr. Cho's board. I would go to Korea, and I would listen to Dr. Cho talk about fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. And I would sit there and go, I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. I speak in other tongues. I've operated in almost all the gifts of the Spirit, but I don't get this fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. And then the revival came in the mid-90s. And for four and a half years, we learned fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. But now I stand at another junction in my life. And I go, Lord, there's something so big, and I'm missing something so huge, so huge that Jesus, you said that what we have today with the Holy Spirit is better than what the apostles had walking side by side with you. And Jesus, the fact that I don't understand that means that I have so much to learn and there's so much more of the Holy Spirit that I have yet to discover and understand about walking with the Holy Spirit and fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. And I would just like to challenge all of you. Keep the fire burning. Everybody say, keep the fire burning. There's more of the Holy Spirit there's more to this river of living water that flows out of our innermost being than I think you and I have ever yet begun to comprehend. Now, with all that in mind, I want us to look at a simple theme today. The priority. The priority of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say the priority. You know, it's amazing today how Christians treat the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a suggestion, when, as we'll see in a moment, it's a command. How people treat the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speak it in other tongues as not really necessary, but it's more than necessary. 
how quickly they can walk away from the supernatural power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit for dead, dry religion. But brothers and sisters, God places a priority. Everybody shout a priority. God places a priority on this experience. It is the second greatest experience, life-changing experience you will ever have in your life. The greatest would be on the day of salvation. The second would be on the day that you receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues. God places an incredible priority on this encounter with the Holy Spirit. Let me illustrate it to you. Jesus commanded the apostles who had walked with him for three and a half years to not leave Jerusalem. John chapter, or excuse me, Luke chapter 24, verse 46. Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Now listen to him in verse 49. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Now Acts chapter 1 verse 4. And while staying with him, he ordered, he, Jesus, ordered them. Everybody say ordered. He didn't suggest it. He ordered them. This is a command of Christ. He ordered them to not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. You will receive ability. It's the Greek word dunamis. It means ability. You shall receive ability when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, beloved, please take a hard look at that. Everything that Jesus lived and died for was put on pause. Just like you pause music on your, on your phone. God hit the pause button on the plan of salvation. God stopped everything. All salvation work stopped. All preaching stopped stopped. All praying for the sick stopped. Everything that Jesus lived and died for stopped. And he said, you stay here. He didn't tell them 50 days. He just says a few days from now. And they were to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, we shouldn't think that that's very strange because if you look in, in Matthew chapter 3, beginning with verse 16, the same thing happened in Jesus' life. Before Jesus began his ministry, so when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest upon him. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you just to pause there for a minute and think about that. Even before Jesus, fully God and fully man, began his human ministry for three and a half years, first the Holy Spirit came upon him. Everybody say, first the Holy Spirit came upon him. And then the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness where he faced temptation for 40 days. I often teach young pastors that you will never begin the destiny phase of your ministry until you have the power of the Holy Spirit and until you face the temptations that Satan will bring to your life. Until you face the fire of temptation and he's, he asks the questions of insecurity and challenges you about who you are and you make decisions. No, 
I will not use the anointing to make stones into bread. I will not use the anointing to enrich myself. No, I will not use the anointing for sensationalism. Jump off the pinnacle of the temple and the angels catch me. And no, I will not use this anointing to have power when he, Satan offered him the kingdoms of this world. And I said, after you face the fire, then the, the destiny ministry that God has for you will begin to unfold. But it all began with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon Jesus' life. Now, brothers and sisters, at some point or another, you and I have to recognize that if Jesus needed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on his life before ministry, and if he commanded the apostles they could not begin their ministry until they received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on their life, maybe you and I need to back up and recognize this is not some experience that you can have if you think it's good and not have if you don't think it's good. This is something that is mandated to be a part of the Christian life and experience. And everybody said? The baptism of the Holy Spirit transforms us into witnesses. That's why it's a priority. Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. Everybody say be. He didn't say, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you'll go evangelizing. He said, you're going to become something. Everybody say, become something. You're literally going to become a witness. See, when, when you become something, nobody has to motivate you to go do something. One of the great challenges in the body of Christ today is people know how to do marketing. They know how to do entertainment. They know how to do sales, but they're not a witness. And so the church is driven by entertainment, and the church is driven by marketing, and the church is driven by business techniques because we're not witnesses. When you are a witness, you function as a witness. Everybody say, I am what I am, and I do what I am. Now think about how the Holy Spirit changed these men. Remember with me all the teaching we did a few months ago on Peter's return to the ministry, on how he denied Christ. And then even after he has back in a relationship with Jesus and Jesus had already appeared to him at least twice, he still led six of the other apostles and they went fishing. They went back to their old careers. They didn't, go, they didn't go back and return to ministry. Think about the apostles that hid for fear of the Jews in room, locked rooms in the city of Jerusalem. Think of these men. And then think of what they were like after the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Ghost came upon them. Peter stands up and faces the whole city and challenges them with a message of salvation. And when they're brought before the Sanhedrin that ordered the death of Jesus, he faces them down and challenges them down about how they had crucified the Lord and challenges them with salvation and challenges them with the promise of the Holy Ghost. You look at these men and you see how transformed they were. The greatest change in your life will occur at salvation. The second greatest change will begin on the day that you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit begins to work within your life. All of a sudden, spiritual growth begins to flow in your life. Remember what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit. There are many Christians, they struggle with sin. Positionally, they are holy and clean before God. Everybody say, my position in Christ. But experientially, they can't stay out of the clubs getting drunk every night. Now, what is it that helps a believer have the power, have the dunamis, have the ability to live a sanctified life. Sanctified just means set apart from sin to God. Everybody say, set apart from sin to God. 
What gives us the power to live a sanctified life that we have a good testimony before the world? The work of the Holy Spirit in our life. We can't live a holy life experientially by, by the strength of our own will, but the Holy Spirit works within us and helps us to, to set ourselves apart from sin and serve God. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. John 16, verse 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. John 14, 26, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. He teaches us. Everybody shout, he teaches us. Every morning when you sit down and read your Bible, the Holy Spirit teaches you. That's where spiritual growth comes from. That's where being more like Jesus comes from. Every morning you sit down and the Holy Spirit teaches you. And the Holy Spirit reminds you. Everybody say, it reminds me. Well, why do, you, why do we need to be reminded of truth, Pastor? Because we forget. Have you ever noticed? Some of you can't even remember the sermon I preached last Sunday. Have you ever got on a jeepney after a service and looked at your relative and you were talking and, and you couldn't even remember what I just preached about? See, that's the work of the devil. The devil comes to steal the seed that has been sown in your heart. When we don't use truth, Jesus said, we forget, we lose truth. So the Holy Spirit not only teaches us, but the Holy Spirit constantly is reminding us of truth. Everybody say, reminding me. Have you ever been in a situation facing temptation and you're about to do something that's wrong and all of a sudden a scripture verse pops into your heart? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Put your hand up high. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, reminding you. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. John 16, verse 8. And when he comes, he will convict or convince the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, that's not our job. Many Christians today try to do the work of the Holy Spirit because they don't know the Holy Spirit. It's not our job. Our job is to preach the gospel. It's not my job to convince a person what a horrible sinner they are. It's my job to show them the answer is Jesus. The Holy Spirit was not just poured out on us Christians. The Holy Spirit has been poured out, the Bible says, on all flesh. How much flesh? So the Holy Spirit is making me a witness, and part of making me a witness is letting me know this is your responsibility and this is my responsibility. The Holy Spirit will teach us the burden that God, Father, and Son has for the lost. John chapter 16, verse 14. Jesus said, He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, for He will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said, He will take what is mine and declare it to you. Everything that is in the heart of Jesus, the Holy Spirit will declare it to us. For God so loved the world. Ah. 1 John 3.16. Greater love hath no man than this, that he laid out his life for his brethren. Ah. Luke 19.41. When he, when he, Jesus, drew near and saw the city, he wept over the city. He loved Jerusalem. He loved the people of Jerusalem. One of the great things that is missing in world evangelism today is emotion. Everybody say emotion. You know, we, we want to do everything in a clinical way. We want to do everything in a theological way. The emotion, the passion that should motivate us, it's not there. Because that's something that the Holy Spirit does in our life. He takes all that the Father has and all that the Son has and declares it to us. This is how the Father loves the lost. This is how Jesus loves the lost and weeps over the lost. And as he begins to show the emotions of the Father and the Son in our heart, there's all the motivation you and I need to be a witness. Many years ago, many, many years ago, when I was still a young pastor here, a man handed me a book and said, 
how to motivate people to evangelism. And I started looking at the book. And it talked about telling sad stories, telling the stories about the people who died when they left the service, all these, these emotional tricks and gimmicks. And I handed it back to him and I said, I won't read this and I won't do that. It's not my job to motivate people. It's my job to point them to Jesus. It's my job to pray for the Holy Ghost to come on people. The Holy Ghost will motivate you for evangelism. Thirdly, the baptism of the Holy Spirit brings boldness into our lives. So, all right, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something we are commanded to receive. It transforms us into a witness, and it brings boldness. Acts 4, verse 29 and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue, that's a key word, to continue to speak your word with boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Everybody say continued. Once the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, Peter and the apostles began to preach with boldness. But now a lot of persecution had come up, challenges had come up. And they said, Lord, we're asking for two things. Number one, we're asking you to do more miracles. And that's something you and I should pray for every day. Everybody shout, Lord, do more miracles. But Lord, enable your servants to continue to preach with boldness. And how did God respond to that prayer? He gave them a fresh outpouring of the Holy Ghost. The first outpouring of the day of Pentecost gave them boldness. The second outpouring of the Holy Ghost gave them boldness. Now, brothers and sisters, when a Christian has been baptized in the Holy Ghost, there's no more Nahia Ako. Can you tell people about Jesus? You just want to look at some people and go, Nahi Ako, I'm in a local now. You're crazy. You're not shy. You need the Holy Ghost. The same outpouring of the Holy Ghost that fell on Peter and turned him and the other apostles from vacillating men hiding for fear into men that could shake a city with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That same outpouring of the Holy Ghost when it comes upon your life and my life gives boldness to us. Everybody shout boldness. Now, now back in the 80s, we couldn't say that word because boldness was considered a bold star, a pornographic star. But now we can say that word. Nobody thinks about bold stars anymore. That's a 1980s thing. So now I can say bold all I want. Everybody shout, I'm bold as a lion. Say it again, please. That boldness doesn't come because of education. That boldness doesn't come because of training. That boldness comes because of an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. Fourthly, the baptism of the Holy Spirit puts a touch of the supernatural upon our lives. Think with me to 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, the gifts of the Spirit. Now, I've never been a person who believes that the gifts of the Spirit are just a function inside the church auditorium like a charismatic carnival. I believe the gifts of the Spirit, and what I see in the New Testament, is the gifts of the Spirit were functioning in everyday life. Ulita nothing, everyday life. That in everyday life, there's words of wisdom and words of knowledge. In everyday life, there's prophetic utterances. In everyday life, there's manifestation of gifts of healing flowing. In everyday life, there's workings of miracles. In everyday life, there's discerning of demonic spirits. In, everybody shout, in everyday life. Say it again. You're walking through the market. You buy your fish. And the lady who sold you the fish all of a sudden looks at you and starts to put her head down, and you can see she's really sick. And you just reach over and in the name of Jesus, let healing flow. 
and the power of God touches her. And there's a miracle. And you just keep walking. <laughs> no big deal. Everybody said, no big deal. Because the Holy Spirit chose to use you. Are we still here? The touch of the supernatural. This is why Jesus looked at the apostles in Mark 16 and said, These signs shall accompany them that believe, because they'd have out, they would have the Holy Spirit upon their lives. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they'll cast out demons. They'll speak in new tongues. In other words, hey, this is expected of us. They'll pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Everywhere you and I go as believers, people should recognize a touch of the supernatural upon our life. Everybody say, a touch of the supernatural. That we're not like everybody else. And beloved, you're not. You're the temple of God. One more time. You need to understand you're not like everybody else in this earth. The Holy Spirit has come upon you. Stand with me, please. I'm going to stop there tonight. Now, out in the cars, in all of the parking lots, all of our other campuses, we can't lay hands on people, which is what we would always do. But soon we'll be laying hands on people again, and everybody said? But tonight, you're going to have to reach out to Jesus yourself. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, tonight you're going to receive in Jesus' name. Amen. Say, well, Pastor, how can you be so sure? Because it's really simple. Jesus commanded you to receive. This is not something you need faith for. This is something you receive. I, I didn't hear you. Amen. Pastor Willie, come here, please. Quickly. Receive this. You noticed he didn't need faith for that. Did you notice? He just took it and received. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Jesus commands us to receive this. You don't need faith for this. You just need to receive what he has commanded you to receive. Are you born again? Yes. Then you're qualified. Well, Pastor Summerall, I don't live very holy yet. Folks, you don't get worthy. The Holy Spirit changes you. He helps clean up your life. You don't clean up your life and get worthy to receive the Holy Spirit. He, he sanctifies you. Amen. Now, if you need to receive the Holy Spirit, and you've never received the Holy Spirit, it's, it's just this simple. Understand you have been commanded to receive. Now, in just a few moments, we're going to pray, and then we're going to worship the Lord. You need to do this out loud. Everybody say, out loud. Out loud. You need to use your mouth. The evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that you speak in other tongues, not that you fall down. Everybody say, speak in other tongues. Speak in other tongues. Say, well, what shall I speak in, Pastor? Do you remember that lady in 1980? We had a group of people down at the old, in the old church, and we were so young and didn't know anything. And I came to this lady, I said, now speak in other tongues. She said, which language shall I speak? I said, what? She said, well, I speak English, I speak Tagalog, I speak French, and what else does she speak? It's like seven languages. Yeah, she spoke all these languages, like some genius lady. And I said, none of them that you know. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will give you the words. And as I taught you last night, your spirit, your spirit man prays with a language the Holy Spirit will give you. So you won't know what to say. But you speak, and the Holy Spirit will give you the language. Amen? And there just comes a point where you stop speaking with the understanding, praying and worshiping with the understanding, and you start praying and worshiping 
in a new language that the Holy Spirit gives you. Amen? It's not difficult. It doesn't take rocket science. I want you just to lift your hands before the Lord right now. Ulita Natan, Father, Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus name I, thank you I thank you for my salvation. For my my salvation. salvation. I thank you for all that you've done in my life. There's a world that needs this message. There's a world that needs to hear of Jesus. And I don't want to just exist in this life. I want to be a witness. Jesus, I stand here. Jesus, I stand here. Baptize me tonight with the Holy Spirit. Pour out your Spirit upon me. Lord, let there be a fresh outpouring upon every believer tonight. Just like you gave a fresh outpouring on the church of Jerusalem. Let there be a fresh outpouring tonight upon everyone here. In Jesus' name. Now just lift your hands and begin to... Just thank him for what he's done for you. Lift your voice. Thank him for your salvation. Thank him for all that he's done for you. Tell him how good and how wonderful he is. Oh, tell him how wonderful he is. Thank him for the provision he's given to your life. Thank you for the healing. Jesus, let your spirit flow now. Let the Holy Spirit flow. Oh, Jesus, pour out your spirit in this place. Pour out your spirit in every car tonight, Jesus. Pour out your spirit in every campus right now, Jesus. Oh, Shabakosata. Oh, just go ahead and begin to speak in other tongues. Oh, pray with the spirit and we pray with the understanding you need to go listen to the sermon last night online on praying in the spirit it'll really help you but the Bible but Paul also says we we sing with the understanding and we sing with the spirit this is the language when we pray in a tongue and when we sing in a tongue our spirit is praying and we're speaking unto God Everybody say, I'm talking to God. I'm talking to God. Say it again. I'm talking to God. Say it again. I'm talking to God. Now we're just going to sing with the understanding first. And then we're going to just lift our voices and use these beautiful new tongues that the Holy Spirit gives us to sing to Him. <laughs>
go home tonight. We're still bumping high. Oh, I've gone over time. I'm sorry. We're still trying to run these 90-minute services at least. I've gone a little over time. Please forgive me. But would you take your communion emblems? When you go home tonight, pray in the Holy Ghost. Lay there on your bed and just hasha mokakaha Pray in the Holy Ghost as you fall asleep. Sing in the Holy Ghost as you fall asleep. Sing in the Holy Ghost as you wake up in the morning. Let your spirit man talk to God. Learn, learn to let this relationship with the Holy Spirit flow in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This bread, this bread represents the body of my Savior. Represents the body of my Savior. He hung on a tree. He hung on a tree. To take the curse of the law. To take, take the, the curse of the law. That the blessings of Abraham, the blessings of Abraham and the covenants of promise, the covenants of promise would flow to my life. Flow to my life. He broke poverty. He broke poverty. Prosperity. Prosperity is his plan for my life. His plan for my life. That I can establish the covenant. I can establish the covenant. Nobody in this world wants to establish his covenant. Nobody in this world wants to establish his covenant. But I do. I, because I remember, yes, I remember what he did for me. What he did for me. Let us partake of the bread together. Ulitanatan, this cup, this cup represents his blood. Represents his blood that washed away. All the shame. All the shame. All the sin. All the sin. Erased all the records in heaven. Erased all the records in heaven. I'm clean. I am clean. Pure. Pure. Before God. Before God. I remember. I remember what my Savior did for me. What my Savior did. And for the whole world. The whole world. Let us partake in Jesus' name. Let us all pray. Father, we thank you so much, oh God, that you will continue to allow us, God, to be put, that you will continue to allow us, oh God, to have boldness, Lord, as we continue to preach the gospel. Father, we pray, oh God, in Jesus' name, that you will cause us, oh God, to grow in our relationship with the Holy Spirit, Lord, that there will be no shyness, Lord, in preaching the gospel until, Lord, we have covered this nation, oh God, with the gospel and even across the world, oh God. We will see a great harvest of soul, oh God, we have ever seen, oh God. Use us, Lord, and give us boldness, Lord. Allow your people to be bold as a lion. And God, even as we depart from this place, we thank you so much, oh God, that your presence will go before your people, oh God. We thank you also for your protection, Lord. Dismiss us, oh God, with your love. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, everyone, and see you again next weekend.